Our next speaker continues to enjoy a distinguished career in the British Army, serving in the likes of Bosnia, Kosovo and Northern Ireland, amongst others, and the First Gulf War. But despite the rigours and the pressures of that job, he also decided he wanted to be a referee. Not in football, I might add. This man clearly has great sense, but in the rather more respectful sport of rugby. Please welcome Major George Clegg. Right, well, thank you very much, Rebecca. Um, there I am, Major George Clegg, 1st of Queen's Lagoon Guards, the Welsh Cavalry, the token Englishman in a Welsh regiment. And believe you me, that has been a pretty traumatic experience, particularly in the late 70s, when Scott Gibbs bounced over that try line and to beat England. Now, in terms of where I come from, just to sort of give you a bit of background, I'm a child of the 60s. I did my formative sort of teenage years in the 70s. So my sporting heroes are the likes of Peter Osgood, David Hemery, John Snow, and my absolute idol, Willie John McBride, the uh, captain and philosopher of the 1974 British and Irish Lions. Famous, as sort of uh, Phil de Glanville perhaps and John Hall will remember, for his inspirational team talks. South Africa, aggressive, really dominant, Willie John McBride, team talk, final parting comment as everybody was leaving the, uh, the dressing room. Now remember boys, get your retaliation in first. And that was the famous 99 call. So not to be intimidated, as soon as the uh, South Africans started generating a bit of aggro, everybody just piled in and really put them on the back foot. So in the best traditions of Willie John McBride, in terms of getting the retaliation in first, I'm going to get my excuses in first. Now, in terms of expectation management, clearly we came here today and I've been absolutely staggered with the sort of uh, educational post-nominals of not only the, de uh, the delegates and the speakers, it's been really unbelievable. So I'm a little bit wary and a little bit awestruck at the moment. Now, looking sort of uh, forward, I'm not going to bore you with some war stories, but basically where, where I've come from. If you were to ask me what were my sporting successes, we've mentioned refereeing, um, sporting successes, participating and playing for the army in rugby. And in, then, in a very quiet voice, he says, over 35s. Yes, I was an army veteran. Um, coaching my regimental rugby side to victory in the British Army Germany Cup. Absolutely spectacular. Absolutely fantastic. But if you were to ask me what the hardest thing I've ever done in my whole military career was, no, I wouldn't be saying sort of crowd control on the streets of Belfast, I wouldn't be saying war fighting in Iraq. I would not be saying peace support operations in Kosovo and Bosnia. I would be saying the hardest thing I've ever done was coaching the Salisbury and Darlington Rugby Club mini section. Until you have coached eight-year-old kids, you just haven't lived. And if you want to get out there and really put your coaching expertise to the test, then get out there and coach the minis. Okay. What am I going to talk about? Well, I'm going to blind you with science with a, a bit of how the military approach designing training. How do we go about it? And there is actually, believe it or not, a bit of science behind it. And what I will try and do is we're going through this uh, explanation. I will try and sort of relate it to how it could or possibly it might even well be doing at the moment, how it relates uh, in a sporting context. So I'm going to sort of outline the defence systems approach to training, how we design training. We're going to go on and have a quick look at how we use statistics in sort of recruiting and selection, how we go about choosing our individuals to join the, the various corps. And then I'm going to stray into an area that I'm not sort of really competent on. It's not my main area, but sort of army physical assessment. 
And I've got to be careful what I'm saying here because we've got a couple of other sort of uh, people in the audience, one of which is a good mate of mine, who will be only too happy to say, no, that's a load of rubbish, George. This is actually how it is done. So I've got to be careful what I'm saying there with regards to physical assessment. We'll have a quick look at trials and experimentation, how we generate uh, uh, trial data, and then I will just quickly sum up with regards to how we use GPS, global uh, positioning systems and all that um, within a military context. Okay, so that is my mission, broadly speaking. Specify through the application of the defense systems approach to training, training systems, media, <laughs> training management which is absolutely vital the quality assurance to make sure that we're doing the right training and the training is right so quality assurance and training uh, uh, management in order to assure that effective and efficient training is maintained clearly we're making sure that we are giving you the taxpayer the best bang for your buck and it's uh, it's the most cost effective training you would probably turn around and say the best training is always going to be live training. But that's not always going to be the case. So we'll be talking about the, the live synth, uh, synthetic balance that we try to generate within the forces with regards to training systems. Right. I'm just going to broadly run through the process of the defense systems approach to training. And I suppose you could map this against how you design your training, perhaps as a, as a coach, um, be it football, rugby, cricket, or indeed uh, an athletics coach. The basis for any training regime has got to be the concept of employment. So basically, it's the game plans. And that should be game plans, uh, uh, like I say, in plural. What it is that you are generating. So in our particular instance, if we're talking about a tank, it is how that tank is employed on the battlefield. It's doctrine, it's game plans, defensive or offensive. So that sets the whole context of how we are going to design the training regime. Having got that context, you are going to sit down and you are going to prescribe, and we do this religiously, all the operational tasks that you are expecting that particular bit of equipment or that person to deliver. So in other words, if I'm using the rugby analogy, you set out all your defensive and offensive game plans, and then for each individual player, from prop all the way down to fullback, you would analyze every single task that you want that individual to perform within that particular scenario. Then, having analyzed all the tasks he's going to perform, you then basically set the training requirement for that particular task. And then, having set the training requirement, you produce for that individual what we are calling an operational performance statement, or just a performance statement, what you want him to achieve. A bit like a job description. So there's your job description, mate. That is what we're expecting you to deliver. Now, key to any training strategy, once you've set the training requirement, is you've got to be able to assess whether that individual has met that training requirement. So your assessment strategy is absolutely critical. You must make sure that you've got a good assessment strategy that tells you that that individual has met the training requirement. And then what we do is we then go through the training options analysis, like I say, whether we are going to do all live training, whether, you know, if I was to pick an example, if I was to say fighting in an urban area, well, clearly, in terms of live training, we cannot drive challenger tanks round towns and blast everything to bits because once you've done it once it's all gone the ammunition's expensive etc etc so that is a classic case where you would probably use a simulated mechanism to deliver that training medium so you would have injected um, a bit like call of duty and call of duty is uh, in terms of the background software is the sort of way that the army's going at the moment you're producing interactive simulation to fill the training gap that cannot be delivered live. And then once you've done all that, 
You then produce a formal straight training statement in conjunction with the training deliverer, and I will explain that uh, in a bit more detail in a minute, to actually articulate the whole of the formal training statement. So that broadly is the defence system's ap approach to training. And it is prescriptive, like I say, because it has to be prescriptive to make sure that it is cost-effective and efficient, and also, uh, basically, you are setting the standard to make sure that that standard is being met. Okay. Right, don't fall off your seats. Okay. So in terms, let's just pick the one component part here, the job analysis. Now, what I've suggested here is I am going to pick, we are going to do the job analysis for a tank commander. So, let's have a look at all the component parts. If I'm doing that job analysis, what does he need to know to be a really effective and efficient tank commander? Well, he needs to know how to operate the CIS, communications and information systems, the radios on the tank, and all the data systems that it might have. He needs to be able to operate the gunnery systems on the tank. He needs to be able to do DNM, driving and maintenance, all the driving and maintenance tasks. If the tank gets knocked out, he needs to be able to conduct dismounted close combat, fire and manoeuvre, getting himself away from the tank. So all the, those are sort of the central technical aspects of it. What you then do is, because it's a tank, MCC tactics, mounted close combat tactics, how he is going to manoeuvre that tank around the battlefield to meet the game plan. So you're considering the tactics that he's doing. That's just his tank. CTO, collective training objectives. So the team, now we're bringing together as an individual and putting him in the team, a four tank troop, an 18 tank squadron. So you're bringing him together and, and basically taking into consideration all that training requirement. And then, like I say, you wrap the whole thing in the concept of employment, the overarching game plan. So you are considering every single training aspect for that individual. Now, once you've catalogued all those tasks, you're going to have a, an absolutely monumental list of things that that guy has got to do. What we then do is we then, and this is where we're starting to produce statistics, but as you'll see in this presentation, producing army statistics is very subjective. It's all dependent on the subject matter expertise of the person analysing the actual uh, statement and then giving it a factor. So basically what we then do is we then put all the tasks in their grouped areas and we give them a factor of difficulty of that task, the importance of the task, and the frequency that that individual is going to complete the tasks. So we do the diff analysis. Difficulty, importance, and frequency. And then clearly, once you've graded them, one to six, one being the most difficult, six, be, uh, sorry, uh, one, one perhaps being the uh, uh, most frequent, six being the least frequent, then basically you can feed that data in and it will give you an, a, a, an order of what that training needs to be and how it needs to be delivered. So once you've done that, you then go back to these training objectives and then you ha allocate them another factor for the performance, the conditions and standards that you want that task to be completed in. So the performance, he must hit the target at 300 meters. The conditions, by day, by night, in all weather conditions. This is where you get into the simulator and in all, uh, in all environments and terrains. Well, clearly, we can't train in the UK for desert environments, so you're probably going to start using synthetic training to, build, to, to fill that particular cap capability gap. And then the standard you want that training objective to be met at. Again, one is probably having done that training objective a number of times to the operational standard. So in other words, the guys, this is an absolutely critical training objective and he needs to be able to complete it to the operational performance standard. And then six, 
because you haven't got maybe the training aids, you're actually sort of giving him, it could be just underpinning knowledge, underpinning knowledge of that particular training objective. So like I say, that's job analysis, and it is prescriptive, and I've got a team of analysts that all they do is sit there producing operational performance statements for individual tank and armoured fighting vehicle crewmen, all the systems. And then over at um, Warminster, they'll have a similar body that will do that for infantry training. Rob used to sit up at up Upaven, and he would do the same for physical training in terms of training and development. The artillery are doing the same. So we've got all these analysts that are producing job specs and basically operational performance statements for every individual and every piece of equipment. So perhaps as a coach, have you got the operational performance statement for the fly half? Have you got the operational performance statement for the centre forward, for the fast bowler, whatever it is? Have you really sat down and analysed what it is you're expecting that individual to deliver? I just throw that out uh, just, just, just to see what happens. Okay, next slide, please. Right, bit of a sort of another complicated um, diagram, but how do we do it? So how do we design training? Well, we, if we start at the bottom left, job analysis. So we've produced the job analysis, operational performance statement, and all the other bits and pieces. We've set the training requirement. Now, that's what I do. I am setting the training requirement. I am in a, a, a formation called the Director of Combat. So we set the training requirement for all fighting stuff. So having designed the training, what we then do is we're the requirements authority. We hand over that performance statement to a training deliverer. Now there is a clear air gap between the TRA, Training Requirements Authority, and the Training Delivery Authority. An example could be, probably not the best one, but if I say that it's the FA, the RFU, the English uh, County Cricket Board, the Athletics Federation, they become the Training Requirements Authority. So these guys are setting the standard and the training requirements. You then hand it over to the clubs, perhaps, who are then the training deliverers. And they crack on and they deliver the training. But for the army, it is important that we have that air gap. Because if you let the training deliverer set the standard, basically what happens, they are under resource pressure. So I can't do that. Let's shave that bit off. Um, that's going to cost a lot of money. Let's sort of fudge that. So there needs to be a distinct air gap so that we can hold them to account. Hold their feet to the fire when they're not delivering. Right, you didn't deliver that individual to the correct standard because you changed the training. If, you're, if you do it straight to the training delivery authority, they can change the training to suit their own resources. But basically, we do the job analysis, we hand it over to the training deliverer. They design the training, and we make sure that that training is right when they've designed it. They then deliver the training, and then they conduct their own internal validation of that training. So they make sure that the training is correct to the training objectives that we have set. So they train up the individual tank commander. He spat out at the other end into the workplace. And there might be some other workplace training that he has to conduct as well. FLC, that's the frontline commands, the infantry battalions and the armoured regiments. So we have produced a tank commander now for them. Now, what we do is we then go out to the frontline commands and we will sit down with them and say, right, is that tank commander delivering the goods for you on the battlefield? And if he is, great. If it isn't, we adjust the training accordingly. And then, basically, we will change and we are the only ones that can change the training requirement. And then, basically, you've got a, a complete loop. And that, broadly speaking, is the defence of systems approach to training. What I'm going to do now is we'll just stray into recruiting. So I'm in the Royal Armoured Corps, and basically those are the metrics that we are looking for 
with regards to a Royal Armoured Corps soldier. Clearly, in terms of your lot, you're going to have a lot, probably a lot more prescriptive performance bits. You know, the age is probably going to be a little bit more reduced. And you're going to have other factors that you're going to consider. But that is basically the standard. Security is that basic clearance. Medical, fit for employment. He's got to have a driving license. All right, he can have eight maximum penalty points on it. But basically, that's it. That's the guy that we want that fits into that bracket to be in the Royal Armoured Corps. Okay, so having decided he wants to join, he goes into the recruiting office and he does the barb test, which basically gives an assessment of verbal, numeric, spatial competence. And that then, we then score that and he gets a score at the end. And then broadly speaking, dependent on the score, will then identify whether he's going to be in the infantry, the logistics, the engineers, the REMI, or the Royal Armoured Corps. So that's the first statistic. That's generated at the recruiting office. He then goes up to Glen Course in Scotland, and he does his army selection test. And again, basically, that's what we're expecting him to do in terms of physical activity. Now, before all you coaches fall off your chair, ha, what do you mean, sort of... Uh, one and, a half, five, one and a half miles in 13.5 minutes is hardly um, sort of Olympic standard. Don't forget, this is the base level. We're building up from this, so this is a recruit soldier. But that's basically what we're expecting him to do physically. Subjective assessments, we'll sit down and see how he talks on an icebreaker. We'll see how he reacts in a military lesson, how he delivers a practical lesson, and it's how to chuck a grenade how he reacts to PTs, team tasks, and what he's like on the interview. And they will be given a factor and a grade. Again, it is subjective. Okay, next slide. And then basically the individual is graded, and his overall assessment grade then decides where he's going to go. And that, broadly speaking, is the selection process. Now, as we'll see, military statistics is great, but they're... They don't join themselves up. Next one, please. Okay, there's the military definition of fitness. We're going into assessment. Now this is where I'm straying into Rob's um, sort of area. That's the definition of um, fitness. Nothing too contentious there, I don't think. Personal fitness. Okay, personal fitness, we know that is just to maintain a level, ward off disease and all the other bits. Vocational fitness is the fitness to do the job. And then combat fitness, match fitness, basically, to get on to the operation. And there they all are. So the, the basic uh, categories. Now, like I say, Rob, Rob does that, or has done that, and that's basically what we're training for, to, to produce that standard. A Mickey Mouse graph, but basically some of the um, uh, athletic coaches will recognize, clearly you can't keep an individual at match fitness level forever it just it, it's just impossible to maintain so again you're building it up the recruit the soldier and then producing fitness for the operation so looking at the personal fitness assessment again a very basic assessment done on sit-ups is the ability to how many sit-ups how far he can uh, and fast he can run in uh, uh, 1.5 miles and how many press-ups he or she can do that's just a basic level uh, basic assessment and then what we do down the left hand side clearly you've got the age of the individual and then what we're expecting him to produce as a minimum like I say not very some of the athletes amongst you will go crikey that's not very sort of prescriptive but that's the minimum standard that we're expecting him to achieve and then basically what we do is we will give each of those a score and then basically the score will go, and if you are over 300, you are really fit. So that's basic fit, personal fitness. Annually, we're expected to do a combat fitness test. So that is your vocational assessment of your vocational fitness. Okay, quickly, running through. Just look at the photographs on the left, and just tell me what you see the soldier in the top doing. What do you see the soldier in the top, top photograph doing? 
He's talking to a boy, but in terms of his physical stance. He's crouched down. What's he carrying? He's carrying a backpack. Okay? Middle photograph. Where do you, what do you see that particular individual doing there? The middle photograph. Yeah, with a backpack. Next to what? A wall. Now, it's, you see where I'm coming from here. When I'm actually analysing what it is we want these soldiers to do in Afghanistan, we're making it sort of specific to what it is that they're expected to do. And when we're designing the training for that, there it is, long, slow patrolling, frequently dropping to the knee, periods of intense and emotional activity when you come under fire, getting off our helicopters or reacting to it, travelling over ground, down wadis and what have you, accessing compounds over the wall, carrying loads for short periods and at speed in really hot conditions. So that is the background and that's how we design the training to deliver that. Don't worry too much about the, uh, the, 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 the actual graphs. The red bit, again, like my previous graph, that's the operation. So it's how we build up the training to meet the standard required for the operation. You'll notice there's a few dips in there. Well, that's clearly R&R when they go back on leave or whatever. So that's where there is a, a dip in training activity. But broadly speaking, it's got to be progressive to allow you to achieve that operational standard. How to train? Okay, basically we had a philosophy of let's train really hard and we must be doing a jo good job. We're trying to be a little bit more intelligent on that. We're trying to, if we train too hard, we'd be getting tons and tons of musculoskeletal injuries and a bit of aggressive evolution. We need to train as individuals and as collective organisations. And that is a summary then of what Rob would have produced for the operational fitness assessments. So depending on what role you were going into, if you were going on a sort of an RLC role, you might only have to do OFT1. If you were going into an infantry role, you'd have to achieve OFT2, the standard. 40 over two days, it's really arduous. But if you're just a base waller, then maybe OFT2 is the one, the standard that you need to achieve. Analytical data. Again, I've said we're not very good in the army at the moment. This is where I'm looking for sports analytics input, so to speak. Basically, we don't join it up. We don't make a through life assessment of a soldier's uh, ability and his performance. We've got something, and uh, as you'll see, all this slide is, we record all the data for all the various tests on a system, but it's not joined up. We need to be a lot more prescriptive in joining all the mechanisms up and using data, because this is just really a record of how that individual's gone, and then the PTI sat in his office will actually make that assessment. And, as ever, we change systems all the time. The, the, the software systems change, so it means if they're not compatible, you've got to re-input -in all the data. So we need something that is actually a through life, and we're not changing systems as we do all the time. Okay, trials and experimentation, I'll just use this as the background. 60, 60 kilograms is the maximum that an infantry soldier can carry. If you have a really good idea for another piece of equipment, then you've got to have a compensating reduction. You've got to take something off. So basically, we've got to be really prescriptive on what it is that we are doing. If you have got a requirement, it has got to be doctrine given, driven. So the game plan has got to drive the change for this piece of equipment. To develop a new capability, and then basically you've got to trial it. Okay, next, next slide. Now what we've done is we've now got a common battlefield training capability. And what uh, also who's got this, the Americans, the Canadians and the Australians have got exactly the same system. So in other words, we're producing data, not only from the British Army, but everyone else is producing the same data because it's the same facility. Okay. That's it in a nutshell, and broadly speaking, it's an obstacle course. And you can put the obstacle course in climatic conditions, but it's basically testing. If I want to bring in a new rucksack, 
I will have a baseline product on the old rucksack and see how I got on going over the obstacle course. For the new rucksack, I then go through the same obstacle course and it's testing all my different mechanisms, ducking and diving, and seeing what impact that has on my performance. And basically, you can say, yep, that is a good product, that is a bad product. But it's got to be able to actually enhance performance. Right, last bit, GPS. GPS in the British Army for assessing performance is a real godsend. We've got a huge training area in Canada. 10, 15 years ago, I was a tank commander. I could go onto that training area, and if I got lost, nobody would know. Absolutely, I, nobody would know. It was great. But now we're all fitted with GPS transposers, and when you get on and do your after-action review, sat in a theatre like this with a screen, blue forces coming up there, red forces coming down there, and a lone vehicle starts going off on the bottom. And they're going... Which call sign is that? It's 33 Alpha. 33 Alpha, what were you doing? I'm going, I don't know, I was lost. And it's pretty obvious that you were lost as well because it's there for all to see. But basically, we use that GPS for after action reviews so you can sit down and analyze what's happened. For situational awareness on the battlefield and on exercise so that you can see where everybody else is. And then for producing patrol traces, you must not set patterns and clearly by using GPS and software that's basically what you can you can produce you will sit down in your sort of football and rugby and you I know you've got the GPS on the back of the players you will analyze what that player has done how far he's run but also is he setting patterns if he's setting patterns if you can identify it Qu Quinn's you will find out that Leicester Tigers game plan pretty quickly if you analyse what they're doing. Are they setting patterns? Do they need to change their tactics, te tactics, techniques and procedures? So this has been a vital component for the British Army in terms of producing after-action reviews, situational awareness and making sure you don't set patterns. Now that was a quick canter through, broadly speaking, statistics and how we generate them in the British Army, okay? Any questions? Everybody happy? I haven't stunned you, I haven't sort of blinded you with military abbreviations. The broad outline is that we are pretty prescriptive in our job analysis, very, very prescriptive. But we're not so good at joining things together from front to back. Thank you. Yes? Absolutely. I mean, say, we talk about managed, delivered solutions. So if we are producing a synthetic trainer, rather than train individuals in every single battalion and regiment to be able to operate that, they always move on on all the other bits and pieces, we will turn around and we will get industry to deliver that solution. So they will turn up with a Pantech with all the simulators in it, and they are responsible for delivering that managed solution because that's more cost effective and efficient and effective than training every individual and having all the simulators all over the place. If you've just got one managed delivered system, it's a lot easier than trying to establish ones in all the barracks and train up everybody to use it. So yes, we do. Anything else? Well, I think I just went slightly over. I do apologise. <laughs> That's it. Thank you very much.